If Momentum Sonic games are any indication, a 3-4-5 melody is a great opening impression for a title theme. So it's cool to see not one but two recent Sonic games use this melody path in a pickup measure. Superstar's title theme arrangement is ready-made for a major network sitcom. Things get rolling with Bridge Island Zone, and the lead melody's starting point motif is centered around the supertonic. And yes, that's what it's called which is just a deluxe name for the two. Oh, you didn't know that each of the seven scale notes have their own name? Now you do, but not all of them work as sonic puns. The two is called the supertonic because the Latin root super means above or over, and this note definitely is right above the tonic home base note of one in the scale. Mass-produced pop music leans on this supertonic as a hypercrutch, and Andrew Wong has a video montage exposing how overused it's become. You can hear this creative complacency in Justin Brillo Timberlake's Chart Topper, Can't Stop the Feeling, which spams that supertonic like it's 2012. So it's encouraging that Bridge Island uses the motif as a starting point, but evolves the pitch class throughout the section with the rhythm intact, even getting the Mushroom Hill treatment with its Mario Cadence chords and a flat 3-2-1 melodic wrap-up. JJ is the creator of another Sonic 2 remake, so naturally he knows the 8-bit catalog very well and spotted a parallel between Bridge Island's main melody and Green Hill's zone. The timing and up-down melodic motions are very alike, but where Bridge Island centers this melody's action on the supertonic, Green Hill's operates on the tonic in pentatonic minor. Since it's pentatonic, the two is dismissed, not even part of the equation. Bridge Island is structured with two main melodic sections, but also features a connecting midsection that could be considered the song's bridge. This bridge does have a lead melody in there, but it kind of hangs back in Act 1, for us to just soak in the overall chords. I think these chords would have sounded great during the Massasaurus bridge chase, though. But unfortunately, what plays during that sequence is other music. In both acts, this bridge section concludes with a curious key change, one that builds upon conventions of Sonic first levels to soar to new heights. We've seen so many first levels in Sonic games wrap up sections with a Mario cadence of flat 6, flat 7, and back to a major keyed home base. And by all appearances, this bridge's ending chords run this same path. But instead of completing this Mario cadence, it zags three semitones above the expected destination to key change there, soaring to the new heights of the North Star Islands, along with the newly added .5D this game brings to the table. Once this key change occurs, in retrospect, that flat 7 chord of the Mario cadence retroactively serves as a powerful no-frills 5 to 1 chord change to kick things into gear for the song's final portion, with a syncopated pull at the moment of the key change as fruit on the cake. But all key changes must eventually return to the original tonic, at least in video game music that loops, 
and sometimes bringing the listener from key to key has to be managed like a wine tasting, where you don't want the aftertaste of one wine to interfere with the taste perception of the next one. So in between, you eat a quick palate cleanser to clear the tongue. Simple stuff like celery, bread, or my personal favorite, oyster crackers. In music, one brute force method of changing back to the original key is to just throw a bunch of oyster cracker chords at the listener, like Jun Sonoy did in Sonic Heroes Seaside Hill. It's a busy misdirect so he could key change back down to semitones in hopes no one noticed. Sure enough, in the Sonoy composed Bridge Island Zone, a couple of quick orchestra stabs is the palate cleanser to reorient us. But instead of spending two years on individual zones, let's glance at some of the other tracks, mainly in the good half of the game. Speed Jungle Act 1 contains the soundtrack's first example of switching a melody from major to minor to blunt the impact as an anticlimax of sorts. That term has a negative connotation, but lowering the stakes in this way makes the eventual consequent phrase hit all the more harder. The 4 to 3 is standard major key operation, but in the next run through the impact is blunted by making the 3 minor. But this anticlimax doesn't leave us hanging or anything, in part because this is just phrase two of four. And that's not even all, because there's two unique phrase four endings. And with this many destinations, we are cooking, people. And another ingredient in the stew is the Sky Sanctuary Ostinato, because reasons. Was this song maybe intended for the Sky Temple level? Maybe the tracks were mislabeled in the final submission to Dropbox. But speaking of USA CD, Speed Jungle Act 2 has no compositional connection to Act 1. It shares something in common with Chrome Gadget though, for a reason that may surprise you. Recall Chrome Gadget's minimal movement on bass, opting for tiny chromatic motions whenever possible, like Section A's oscillation between the tonic and major seventh right below it. Speed Jungle Act 2 features the same limited movement, with its bass groove limited to the same tightly packed notes, with a touch of the super tonic to boot. This limited motion is sensible for a level that brings back Sonic 4's beloved Fog of Darkness overlay, where you can't see more than a few semitones away from our tonic, which makes the occasional ascension to the 4 a significant event. And even if it's interrupted constantly by Fang's distinctive anthem, Speed Jungle Act Sonic provides a useful case study on note divisions. So here's a quick quiz. Would the lead melody notes you're hearing here be considered triplets? No, they are not triplets. And part of how you can detect this is noticing how that last note's duration is shorter than the others. See? So this is different than a triplet, because with a triplet you're taking a span of time and dividing it equally into three equal parts, which snaps the notes to a different divisional grid, independent from the normal grids of twos, fours, and eights. The triplet you'll notice from now on is in the second measure of the Zelda theme, where this measure's last beat is divided into three equal parts, shortly after the first measure's final beat is split in four. If you want, you can just flat out put continuing triplets on a 4-4 beat, 
but Snoop Dogg has grown tired of how this template's become overused. That's what's wrong right now. Everybody trying to rap the same style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why Snoop will appreciate that Speed Jungle X Sonic doesn't use pure triplets, because the sizes of each note are not all equal. This span is broken down into eight increments with note durations of three, three, then two, providing a general structure of threes while still snapping to the 4-4 four, four beat division. Despite being around for hundreds of years, the field of music theory hasn't settled upon a definitive name for this pattern of notes. After making the Endless Mind video, I considered calling this a cyber show, because wouldn't the Endless Mind motif description roll off the tongue better by just saying two cyber shells? This was back during Cyber Shell's second absence, which could have lasted nine years or more. So it would have been a gesture to maintain community awareness because Watching his stuff, along with the works of Doc Future, had a formative influence on my creative voice. Uh, but then Cyber made his epic return, so that would have been weird. Abandoned bit. Knuckles likes to call these grapes, since a bunch usually has some mini grapes included. Movie 2 even has a grapes bit hinging on your familiarity with the Sonic 3 instruction manual. But speaking of Doc Future, if Sonic Forces soundtrack fans are looking to feel seen, could Sega interest you in Sonic the Hedgehog Superstars? Because in the bygone era of 2017, who could forget the epic reveal of Forces' main theme instrumental, Fist Bump? Long before Hoobastank's vocals were included, Doc Future contributed his own commemorative lyrics, seemingly within 24 hours of the initial reveal. But it was just one reason to be a hero That's a big old country Cornbread fed booty That is what I crave it. But then you say can't ever stop me Oh yes, you can keep your rings and emeralds Fistbump's ending melody shows up at the very end of Speed Jungle Act Sonic but if I want to sing along, I have to wait before entering the auto-scrolling boss area. Otherwise, Fang's theme cuts it off too soon. Everyone tell your mom. Yeah, okay. And you know Momentum Sonic's pinball legacy is carried through to superstars in Pinball Carnival Zone. You may have been unaware that Studiopolis is part of the Spring Yard bumper lineage, but Pinball Carnival seems to reference Studiopolis Act 1's composition, because it's easy to sing that zone's melody on top of Pinball Carnival's chords. <laughs> Pinball Carnival's less inspired moment has rhythmically disparate pentatonic blues walks up and back down. Thankfully, the Act 2 arrangement adds a great halftime beat, and even upgrading the 7 to major on the walk back down, which retroactively makes Act 1's version better. Now the intro notes of Pinball Carnival 2 may have jumped out at you as a Mystic Cave reference. Which calls to mind the Carnival Night video, where we saw Mystic Cave bring in carnival melodies to cue up the circus of horrors in the scary caves. So the precedent is strong for this Halloween-y act too, but looking at the differences of how these melodies are transcribed, how can they sound so similar if they have such different quantities and placement of notes? Well, as you know, note timing is paramount especially on the strongest spots of beats 1 and 3. So the fact that in these spots both melodies have a 1, then a tritone, is the structural parallel that connects it all, despite so many other varied notes. And what do you know, Sonic's washed up on the shores of Lagoon City Zone, with compositional touches that probably sound super familiar. This composing approach is similar to LEGO Dimensions, with music that sounds a lot like the original, but was tweaked just enough so that it's legally distinct, preventing the need to send Masato Nakamura a check for thousands of dollars. Some of these notes reach pretty high in their pitch, resulting in a hilarious grating nightmare.
So let's immerse ourselves in the watery dance of the Lagoon City music's compelling narrative of Remember Hydrocity? Not knowing how to end the song, the instruments quiet down for a Mario cadence in hopes no one notices. But that Act 2 track, though, which definitely remembers the face of its father, Sonic CD, with a touch of the rhythm instruments backing minor 7 to 1, straight out of Collision Chaos. The CD is strong with this one. It's a simple thing, but can be incredibly powerful and elegant, as seen in Klonoa's Second World. And everything's all okay when we get to Section B's halftime tempo breakdown, set to a visual panorama of this level's background, which could only be described as brave and stunning. The one remaining stop in our superstar's journey is Cyber Station, which could be the game's last tolerable zone. The Frontier cyberspace sound is strong with this one, using a distinctive techno beat rhythm that some comedians built a career on describing. And they just play that one beat all night. <laughs> Somebody scream! Right? Here's another rhythmically disparate pentatonic walkdown, but it's more effective than pinball carnivals, because here it's presented as an appetizer instead of an entree, as the gang finds their footing in this cyber funhouse. The synth bass uses the anticlimax structure from before, returning to the one with a passing tone major seventh, but the next time it's just that plain minor seventh. These tweaks subtly evolve as the track progresses, culminating in a passing tone return to the one with a syncopated pull on the moment of the tonic return. Subtle but impactful composition choices like these are a big reason I do what I do here. These delicate choices were never the main point or the purpose of the song, but they are here to be discovered and savored. And especially in this game, finding and cherishing the good is necessary to enjoy the merits of a game so frustratingly uneven in its music and more broadly. But we can thank our lucky North Stars that some zones got the rearrangements they did, because for example, Sonoi's solo version of Bridge Island is in the game's music files. And this would have been a very different experience on level one of a release day $60 purchase. Maybe the whole soundtrack was supposed to get rearrangements, but they ran out of time, money, or care. Either that, or it was a deliberate choice to include all styles of classic Sonic music. A terrible call since this is supposed to be an original game, not some scrapbook anniversary retrospective high five. But that same Jun Sonoi sound directed Generation soundtrack, which is certified flames, so scientists will try to make sense of this for years to come. After completing the story, a lot of players are left guessing why the game is even called Sonic Superstars. It could be an uninspired meta-reference to the all-star lineup of game designers and composers who contributed to the game. We Sonic fans have come to know that there's often a catch. After waiting decades for a side-scrolling momentum game with fully original zones, even finally keeping Green Hill Zone out of the equation, the rub is a decentralized soundtrack that doesn't know what it wants to be at its core. But we should not ignore the fact that the Sonic 4 music aesthetic does have its fans, to which I say, respect. That aside, it is an objective fact that a lot of the Sonic community subjectively finds this music grating, as a counterproductive step back to the mobile adjacent experiments of 2010. While nowadays we should only be moving Sonic forward into the future with fresh creativity. 
because at the end of the bridge, none of us want the Mario Cadence subversion as it soars to new heights to go to waste. Nothing will take away my fond memory of hearing this key change in the multiplayer reveal trailer, just as no one can take away my experience of the game's handful of perfect details, like the way Sonic's arms are positioned when he launches off a spring.